Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, I'm really glad to be here in Thailand. I always wanted to come to Thailand, so I'm glad to, uh, to be here in the Fixed Point Theory Lab. My, um, I told, I have two kids. My, uh, I told my daughters that I was going to the Fixed Point Theory Lab. <laughs> and she said, oh, uh, do you have a Fixed Point Theory Lab? And I said, <laughs> no, I, I never been to a Fixed Point Theory Lab, so this is great. Uh, thank you uh, very much for having me, and thank you, Professor Kumam, for setting up the trip. Um, I hope you will please interrupt me if you have any questions while I'm speaking. I hope you will understand everything. Usually when, um, when I go to a math talk, I expect to understand everything at the beginning, and then maybe at the end there's some things I don't understand, but I hope that you'll understand everything at the beginning at least. Please let me know if, uh, if you want me to explain anything. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to tell you about um, Nielsen theory a little bit. This talk is uh, about topological fixed point theory, specifically Nielsen theory. This is uh, topological means that we consider the spaces that we talk about. We always consider them up to homotopy equivalents. Um, and the functions, we always consider them up to homotopy. So, whenever I talk about a function, I will not be very specific about exactly what the points are. What um, It's always up to homotopy. So there will be no metrics. We're not going to use any metrics or geometry at all. It's all purely uh, topological. Uh, we're never going to talk about specific locations of the fixed points. Um, so in topological fixed point theory, we usually don't talk about things like algorithms for finding fixed points because Topologically speaking, we usually that's not the kind of thing that we care about usually. So that's uh, that's the idea here. So what can you say about fixed points of some function without using any geometry? I hope you can. Can everybody hear me? It's not okay. Let me know if I'm not loud enough. Uh, so here's an example of a theorem in uh, topological fixed point theory. Um, let let's let f be a self map on the circle from S1 to S1, um, you know those maps have a degree, which is like how many times the circle wraps around. It's defined homologically. So if F is any map of degree K, then here's the theorem. Uh, F has at least absolute value K minus one fixed points. This is a true theorem. Uh, this is topological because I didn't say anything about, about anything except the degree, which is a, which is a, a topological invariant. So a big kind of general question that we ask is, how many fixed points can you achieve by changing the map by homotopy? That's a big question that is typically asked in topological fixed point theory. Um, here's one easy thing to observe. You can always change the map by homotopy to increase the number of fixed points. If you have a fixed point, it's easy to make more fixed points. And here's a little picture. Uh, you've all seen pictures like this, I'm sure. The fixed points here, there are two fixed points there, the intersection with the diagonal. Can we change this to create more fixed points, change by homotopy? That means like this, this blue part, the graph here, we're going to change it a little bit to make more fixed points. And here's one way you can do it. You can just add a bunch of little wiggles. And the little wiggles can make more fixed points. I made uh, six here, but you can make as many as you want by making extra wiggles. So that's what I mean when I said we can always change by homotopy to increase the number of fixed points. That's easy. What about uh, decreasing or minimizing the number of fixed points? This is much harder. It's much uh, less clear how you can do this. Is it possible to decrease the number of fixed points? Well, in this example, you can. Actually, you can move this uh, graph all the way up and make zero fixed points if you want to. But for some other examples, it's not so obvious. Anyway, here's the... Uh, this is the sort of basic invariant that Nielsen theory is designed to measure. The minimum number of fixed points, and Siraj will mention something like this. Um, this is the minimum number of fixed points of any map homotopic to F. So you start with F is something, and you ask, what is the smallest number of fixed points I can make if I change F by homotopy? And this is much harder than, um, than increasing the number of fixed points. And this is what Nielsen theory is about. So I'm, uh, I'm going to try to explain to you um, the theory that is used to try to compute this, this quantity here. 
All right. Uh, topological fixed point theory, I would say, like, historically speaking, uh, one early thing that you could say is it starts with this uh, Brouwer fixed point theorem around 1912. It says any self-map of the disk uh, has a fixed point, and Siraj will mention this in his talk. Um, what about spaces other than the disk? Now, this is a topological theorem, so it's not, the disk means, you know, like a circle and all of the stuff inside of it. But it's not actually important that it's a round circle. It could be anything which is topologically the same. What about other, like, completely different spaces? Um, there's a more general fixed point theorem by Lefschetz, which works for any uh, self-map of a compact polyhedron. This, this is very general kind of space. And he made this definition. This is the Lefschetz number. You do this uh, alternating sum of the traces of the induced maps in homology. And this will be an integer, so if you use the integer homology, then this uh, sum of the traces will be an integer. And it's a homotopy invariant. That's because the, um, those, those uh, induced homomorphisms here, the FQ, are all homotopy invariant. If you change F by a homotopy, those, those traces will not change. And so uh, that means this sum of the traces will not change. Uh, it's important because of this. This is the theorem that Lefschetz proved about it uh, almost 100 years ago. For any self-map, if the Lefschetz number is non-zero, then F has a fixed point. So this is the Lefschetz fixed point theorem. Uh, Lefschetz proved this. Uh, I said this is true for polyhedra. Uh, actually, Lefschetz only proved it for a manifold, but then Hopf, uh, a few years later, proved it for all compact polyhedra. Um, now, if you're talking about the disk, I said before the Brouwer theorem is just about the disk. If, the, uh, if it is the disk, then you can compute the Lefschetz number very easily. See this trace here? If, the, uh, if x is just the disk, the um, homology of the disk is, uh, it is like the uh, dimension 1 in, uh, in the 0 dimension because it's connected. So you have, um, oh, I said here, all of, the, uh, all of these traces here will be 0 except for the 0 dimension, which is the identity. That's because um, the higher homology groups for the disk are all 0 because it's a contractible space. So when you add up the traces here, you get 1 because the only term here is the q equals 0 term, and the trace of, of that will be 1. And so the Lefschetz number on the disk is always 1, which means by the Lefschetz fixed point theorem, uh, any map on the disk has a fixed point. So this, you could say this is a, a more powerful version of Brouwer's theorem. On the disk, it does give you the Brouwer fixed point theorem, but it works for other spaces also. All right, um, I thought maybe I should tell you a little bit about why you should believe this Lefschetz theorem. What does this thing here have to do with fixed points at all? Um, one thing, so the first thing to observe is this. This is not obvious, but it turns out when you're doing the trace in the homology groups, it is the same as the trace. Here, these are just the chain groups. In, uh, so when you are defining the homology, before you do the quotient with the boundaries, you just have the chains. Um, and these are the same. The traces here are the same. This isn't obvious, but it's because of uh, the way that the... Um, alternating sign works. There's sort of a cancellation in between when you do the quotients to make the homology. And these, these two things end up being the same. Uh, anyway, I hope you believe me when I say that. Uh, let's assume that we do have a simplicial map on a compact polyhedron. And what does it mean if the Lefschetz number is non-zero? Well, it means that one of these traces must be non-zero. If the whole thing, this whole sum is not zero, then uh, that means there is one non-zero term in this thing. One of those traces is not zero. What these traces are, um, that means there's a simplex S uh, which maps onto itself because that's what, what it means to have a non-zero trace. It means something uh, goes onto itself in the, uh, in the linear map that you're talking about. And so there is a simplex S with uh, FQ of S equals S. That means, uh, at least like locally, geometrically, we have this simplex which is being mapped onto itself by the function. And a simplex is the same topologically as a disk, and so that means that there is a fixed point in that simplex because it maps onto itself. And so by the Brouwer fixed point theorem, there must be a sim uh, fixed point in that simplex. And that's why the Lefschetz number, or that's why the Lefschetz uh, theorem is true, because if this number is not zero, then there must be a trace which is not zero which means there's a fixed simplex, which means there's a fixed point. That's how it goes. 
Uh, here's a fun little application. Um, here's a theorem. If x is contractible, then x has the fixed point property. You know, the fixed point property, it just means every continuous self map has a fixed point. If it's contractible, that means, here's why this is true. If it's contractible, that means that the bottom dimension homology is the integers and all the other dimensions are zero. And if that's true, when you do the left shots number, this uh, trace, of, you know, when you, when you add these up, you must get one. There's, not, there's nothing else that you could get. The only term which is, um, well, all the higher terms are zero. So the only term in this, in this sum is the Q equals zero term. And um, since the thing is contractible, or since it's connected and your, your function is mapping this component onto itself, the dimension zero trace equals one. So you get the left shots number one which means there's a fixed point, and so any contractible space has the fixed point property. Actually, it's, this is not the easiest way to prove this theorem, but that's, uh, that's that. All right. All of this, I will remind you, is topological, right? Um, what more can we say about the fixed points of a function when we change the map by a homotopy? I haven't actually talked about that yet. Uh, changing the map by a homotopy, like this function again. When I say change it by a homotopy, I mean... Um, you know, move the graph around in a continuous way. How will the fixed points change if you move the graph a little bit? If we change the uh, graph a little bit, I think it's not so hard to see, then the fixed points will change a little bit, right? Here's what I mean. Look at that, a moving picture. I came all the way to Thailand, so I had to have some fancy pictures. It's not very fancy, I don't know. Uh, you can see as we change the function by a, a homotopy, the fixed points move around in, I don't know, in kind of a nice way. They don't move in a wild way. They move in a continuous way, right? Things that I would like to notice about how the fixed points change. Usually, the fixed points just move around a little bit. If you only change the function a little bit, the fixed points will just move around a little bit, right? Sometimes it's possible for two fixed points to combine into one. That's what happens right here at this moment. There were two, but they come together and make one. And sometimes the one point will just go away entirely. It will disappear into nothing. Uh, or you could think of it the other way around. It is possible to have no fixed points, and then one will appear from nowhere. So it is possible for two to combine into one. It's possible for one fixed point to just disappear. And conversely, it's possible for a fixed point to appear. All right? And uh, in the 20s, Hopf looked at this, looked at the Lefschetz number, and was thinking a lot about the Lefschetz number and also the degree um, of a function. And Hopf realized that you can, um, well, he created something called the fixed point index. Uh, a fixed point can be assigned an integer value, and we call this the fixed point index. And in dimension one, like the example that I just drew, I mean, the domain of the function is dimension one. The index is easy to define. Now, the, the, uh, the example I've been looking at have been the domain was the real numbers. Typically, in uh, Nielsen theory, we only consider compact domains. And so the dimension one case, if it's going to be compact, would be the circle or an interval. Anyway, you can easily define the fixed point index in that case. Uh, here, you see um, when f goes down through the diagonal, so that when the graph is going down when it passes the diagonal, that's an index plus one fixed point. And when it's going up through the diagonal, that's an index minus one. I hope you can see that all right. All right. Or, or actually, like your, your little uh, logo here for the fixed point theory lab, it looks like I have this one down here would be a plus one index. This one in the middle would be a minus one. And then this one up here is another plus one. That's how the fixed point index is defined. All right, when f is going down through the diagonal, it's plus one. When it's going up through the diagonal, it's minus one. If the graph touches but doesn't go through, that's defined to be an index zero, um, which there isn't one like that on this picture or on your uh, fixed point theory lab logo. Um, typically, the index is, is just like this. I was describing it kind of informally here. But um, if you have a derivative of your function, then the uh, index is the sine of one minus the derivative. This will capture this, what I was saying about going down or going up. All right. So it looks like this. What happens when you change the function by a homotopy? That same thing. The index will stay the same, as you will notice, right? If you move the function a little bit, the fixed point will move a little bit, but the index will still be plus one. If it was plus one, it'd still be minus one. Um, 
Of course, if you change the function a lot, you can have two fixed points come together. But you notice here that when they do come together, there's one moment when it's only one fixed point, but that's a zero because I said part of the definition was if it doesn't go through, then it's a zero. All right? There's just one brief moment when it becomes a zero. So when something like this happens, when two fixed points combine by a homotopy, because of the way it's defined, the index is additive. When you have two fixed points, they each have some index. If they combine, the index adds together. So in this example, you had a plus one and a minus one. They come together, and it makes a zero. And uh, that's what I just said. They get, you get a zero when you combine a plus one and a minus one. And a zero can disappear. This is another feature of the, the definition of the index is that when you have a fixed point of index zero, it is possible to remove that fixed point entirely by a homotopy. And you can see that's what happens in this picture here. Uh, or up here, I said, it is possible if you have a function with no fixed points, um, usually it's possible to create a new fixed point which has index zero. All right. Uh, in case you're wondering, all of these definitions have been in dimension one. In higher dimensions, you can make the definition like this. So remember, uh, what we had before was the sign of one minus the derivative. If you want to do that in higher dimensions, you can use the derivative matrix, the Jacobian matrix. And it turns out the proper way to make the definition is this, the sign of the determinant. These inside the parentheses are matrices, so you have to turn it into a number somehow. And it turns out you take the determinant of that. Identity matrix minus the derivative. Take the determinant and then the sign of that. And this is the definition of the index in higher dimensions. Uh, all of this, of course, this only works if the derivative exists and if this determinant is not zero. Um, that's not always going to be the case, but it turns out there are other ways to make the definition of the index, even if this is not true. So, and in fact, even if it's not a smooth manifold, even if your manifold has, uh, you know, uh, non-smooth points in it, it's still possible to make this definition. Uh, but I don't want to get into the details of that. All right, this is an additive index. It's true. It is a homotopy invariant, like I said before. And Hopf actually proved what we now call the Lefschetz Hopf theorem. It says, if you take all the fixed points, and for each of them you add the index, and you take that sum of everything, it all adds up to the Lefschetz number. And so for this reason, people sometimes say that the fixed point index is like a local version of the Lefschetz number. The Lefschetz number is defined over the whole space. But if you just look at the individual fixed points, you can add up their fixed point index, and what you get is the Lefschetz number. Uh, I'll just say axiomatic definitions exist also. In fact, it is true, you know, the, in, the fixed point index is additive and it's a homotopy invariant. In fact, it is true that it is the only additive homotopy invariant that makes any sense in this, in this setting. And so um, there are definitions of the index which just prove your uniqueness theorems about additive homotopy invariants. I'm not going to get into that, but it's true. All right. Uh, remember, this is the main thing that I want to talk about, the minimum number of fixed points when you change a uh, function by homotopy. And here's where uh, Nielsen comes in. This is called Nielsen theory because based on Nielsen's basic idea here was to group the fixed points together into classes. They're called the Nielsen classes or the fixed point classes. And the classes are meant to group together those fixed points which can be combined by homotopies. Generally, uh, you will have a bunch of fixed points of your function. Some of them maybe you can combine them together. Some of them maybe you cannot. And those are the fixed point classes. The number of such classes is a, is a lower bound for this number, the minimum number of fixed points, because um, if you have a certain number of fixed points, you group them into the ones which can be combined and the ones which cannot. The number of groupings would be the lowest possible number of fixed points that you could possibly get. All right. And the basic theory of fixed point classes is, was done by Nielsen around this time. Um, a lot of the formalization of Nielsen's basic ideas was done shortly after by Reitemeister and, uh, and Vecken. So a lot of the things that we describe as being Nielsen theory were actually due to uh, this, these other people. Um, here's a, a basic idea. Um, I'm going to talk about the universal covering space of X. This is a simply connected covering space uh, with uh, some projection map here. And consider the fixed point sets of the liftings of F. Uh, the idea is you take some lifting to the universal cover space. If you just choose one to start with, we call that the reference lift. And then any other lifting to the covering space is, uh, has this form. It looks like 
gamma f tilde, where gamma is uh, some element of the fundamental group. This is because you know the fundamental group uh, acts freely on the universal covering space. And it's easy to show, it's not, um, it's not obvious why you would want to do this, but once you get the idea, it's not hard to show this. The fixed points of the function, uh, sort of at the bottom, the fixed point set is the union of fixed points of the different liftings. Every function on the set, uh, on the space X can be lifted in several different ways. And those liftings have their own sets of fixed points. And if you take those fixed points of the liftings and send them back down into the space downstairs, what you get is the whole uh, fixed point set. Um, and these sets inside this union are the fixed point classes. It turns out the, um, the fixed points of the individual liftings have a lot to do with which points can be combined, which fixed points can be combined in the, uh, in the space X. So we say X and Y in the fixed point set are in the same fixed point class when they both come from fixed points of the same lifting in the universal covering space. Uh, and Nielsen saw that this is a necessary condition for fixed points to be combined by a homotopy. If you want to combine two points together, it is necessary that they are both fixed points of the same lifting in the universal covering space. Uh, there's another condition for this, if you don't like universal covering spaces, which I'll say in a moment. Here's an equivalent definition of the fixed point classes, which was also discovered by Nielsen. Um, X and Y are in the same Nielsen class, if and only if there's a path alpha from X to Y, where alpha as a path with, with fixed endpoints is homotopic to F of alpha. This actually you saw, I don't know, on the, on the picture, the, uh, the poster for this talk, there's a little picture of, of this, which I'm, I'll show you on the, next, uh, on the next paper. Like this, right? This is a moving version. Um, so I have two fixed points, x, which equals f of x, that's a fixed point, and then another one, y equals f of y over here. And they are in the same fixed point class if you can find some path from x to y. Um, it, you know, since these are fixed points, then this path, if I apply f to the whole path, it will also be a path between these two points because the, uh, when you apply f to the first endpoint, you get the same thing, and when you apply f to the, the, end, the other endpoint, you get the same thing. So... Um, the path alpha um, and f composed with alpha are both paths from x to y. And if those two paths can be connected by a homotopy, then uh, x and y are in the same fixed point class. So uh, technically, they're in the same class if there exists some alpha such that this is true. It doesn't have to be true for all paths alpha, but there, um, if there exists some path alpha like this, then they're in the same fixed point class. And it's not so hard to see that this is necessary. If, think about, if you really want to combine X and Y as two fixed points in a, in a continuous way, you have to like, you know, grab those two points and pull them together. Now, if you're going to do that, this path alpha will reduce down to a constant path. And this path, F composed with alpha, will also reduce down to a constant path if you will actually combine those two points. Um, which means if all of these, everything you see in this picture must combine, uh, collapse down to a constant, it means that there can't be like a hole in the space in the middle of this, uh, of this diagram. It must be, um, those two paths must be homotopic. All right, this is, uh, this is like the picture that you always see in a talk about Nielsen theory. Uh, this definition with liftings I think is less easy to understand, but it turns out to be a little easier to work with when you're trying to prove things. Uh, the union over here, can I just talk about this union, is not a disjoint union. So when you look at all the lifts of the function in the universal cover, um, they may have some fixed point sets which are the same or overlapping. It turns out, though, it's not so hard to decide when they intersect. And here's a condition. So uh, if we have two fundamental group elements, we say they're in the same Reitermeister class because Reitermeister talked about this, or this is sometimes called a twisted conjugacy class. So uh, gamma and sigma are in the same twisted conjugacy class. It means there exists some other group element, Z, oh, sorry, uh, such that gamma equals this thing, Z inverse sigma uh, F of Z, where this F is the induced map in the, in the fundamental group. This is called twisted conjugacy because this looks like a conjugacy relation in a group. If the F was not there, then this would be conjugacy. But the F is there, so we call it twisted conjugacy. All right, uh, and in this case, if this is true, that uh, if the sigma and the gamma are twisted conjugate like that, uh, we write it this way. The class of sigma is the same as the class of gamma. Uh, and it's not so hard to prove. In this union here, 
The sets, I said it's not a disjoint union, but you can say very specifically the sets inside the union, if those two classes are the same, then those sets are equal. And if the classes are different, then the sets are disjoint. The fixed point sets are disjoint. Uh, and so this means the Nielsen classes of the fixed points are more or less in correspondence with the Reitermeister classes. If you have two fixed point classes with the same Reitermeister class, then they're the same set of fixed points. And if they have a different Reitermeister class, they are disjoint sets of fixed points. All right. Some of these uh, fixed point sets in the lift up here might be empty sets. So uh, really, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's, it's an inclusion. The fixed point classes are, uh, are a subset of the Reitermeister classes in the, um, in the fundamental group. All right. OK, anyway, back to the uh, minimum number of fixed points. So the smallest possible set of fixed points you could get would be achieved when every fixed point class has only one point. The fixed point classes separate out the points which could never be combined together. And then in each class, you can, at least in theory, combine all of those points into, into one point each. And so the smallest number of fixed points would be the number of such fixed point classes. Um, this would happen when every fixed point class has been combined into one single fixed point. Actually, it's possible that uh, the fixed point class could be removed entirely, combined into one fixed point, which then goes away. So it could also be zero points. And how do you tell the difference? How do you know if some class can be totally removed by a homotopy? You use the fixed point index. The, uh, the fixed point index will tell you if the point can be removed. If it's an index zero, you can remove it. And if it's an index not zero, then you can't remove it. So the fixed point index tells you if a class can be removed by a homotopy. So the Nielsen class is called essential if the total sum of the, index, the fixed point index in that class is non-zero. That's called essential. If it is uh, zero, then we call it inessential. These are the ones which you cannot make empty by homotopies. You cannot remove all the fixed points because some of them have uh, index non-zero. And the number of essential fixed point classes is called the Nielsen number. So to find the Nielsen number, you figure out what all the fixed point classes are, and you find all the index of each one. And the number of classes which are not index zero, that's called the Nielsen number. All right. And this is not easy to uh, compute. But anyway, it is automatically true that the Nielsen number is a lower bound for the minimum number of fixed points of your function because of everything that I just said. And in most cases, it turns out that these are equal. And so the Nielsen number is a fairly computable way to measure the minimum number. I say fairly computable because in practice, actually, it's pretty hard to compute the Nielsen number in, um, in most cases, although there are some cases when it's not very hard. And we'll talk about it. All right, uh, let's talk about some simple examples. So there's always two parts to the computation of the Nielsen number, and they're very different. Um, one part is to figure out where are the fixed points and what the indices are. That's one part. And the second part, oh, I'd say that, that first part is really geometric, because you need to know around each fixed point. You figure out the index, which is like something about the derivative uh, near that fixed point. These are, this is a geometric part. And then part two is determine the Reitermeister classes. That's the twisted conjugacy classes. Um, and this is algebraic. So there's, you have to be able to do both of these things in order to find the Nielsen number. Let's just look at self maps on the circle, all right? Um, the Nielsen number is homotopy invariant. That's automatic because both of those two parts are homotopy invariant. One was the fixed point index, which is homotopy invariant. And the other was the Reitermeister classes, which is purely in the algebra, in the fundamental group. So that's homotopy invariant. Um, if we're talking about the circle, then the only relevant information uh, for homotopy invariant would be the degree. So we should be able to say this just in terms of the degree. If we assume the degree is d, then any degree d map can be changed by a homotopy into this map, the, uh, the powers. So this is just wrapping the circle around itself uh, d times. And such a map has this many fixed points. Absolute value of 1 minus d, that's not hard to, you could just compute that directly uh, if you wanted to. It turns out, if you look at the derivatives and all that, the, the fixed points of each of, the, uh, of each of those fixed points will have the same index, and it'll all either all plus one or all minus one, depending on exactly what the uh, how you're going to measure the degree and all that. Um, so that's the end of the geometric part for this one. You can compute what are the fixed points. There's this many fixed points, and they all have the same index. All right. That means automatically, actually, the left shuts number is, is equal to 1 minus d. 
But um, what about the fixed point classes in this example? So you have to do a little algebra for this one. For the circle, the fundamental group is the integers. So it's not going to be very hard, the algebra we have to do. When are two numbers twisted conjugate? Well, you have to solve this twisted conjugacy relationship. In the case of the uh, circle, this is an abelian group. And so I, I'm writing with this uh, as additive groups, abelian group. And it's easy to solve this formula here. If it's degree d, then this homomorphism is just multiplication by d. And then you can rearrange the formula here. It looks like that. And so when does such a z exist? Uh, x is twisted conjugate to y if and only if x equals y mod 1 minus d. That's because this says x equals, and then over here, y minus some multiple of 1 minus d. So the uh, twisted conjugacy classes on the circle are, are fairly easy to compute, and it goes exactly like this. So this, this means the set of Reitermeister classes, the set of twisted conjugacy classes, there are exactly 1 minus d of them, or whatever uh, absolute value of 1 minus d. That, this might be negative, so when you're counting how many there are, they are absolute value of 1 minus d. That was the algebra part. So we did the geometric and the algebraic, and then you just have to sort of put it all together. We had this many fixed points of non-zero index, and the Reitermeister classes, it turns out, uh, each one of these is going to be in a different class. We already saw that. That was how many classes there are, and it's not hard to see. Each of those fixed points is in a different Reitermeister class. So that means this number, the absolute value 1 minus d, is equal to the Nielsen number, because these are, each of these represents a fixed point class which has index either plus 1 or minus 1, not 0. All right, so the Nielsen number is 1 minus d. Uh, absolute value 1 minus d. In this example, also the minimum number of fixed points must be 1 minus d because we had one specific map which actually had that many fixed points. And it can't be less because uh, the Nielsen number is a lower bound. All right, so the Nielsen theory of the circle is pretty easy. I mean, it took a while for people to figure this out, but once, uh, once you know what you're doing, it's pretty easy. Um, there's a similar formula for maps on Tori by Brooks, Brown, Pack, and Taylor. Um, in the 70s, they figured out, uh, if you view the torus as a quotient of the real numbers, quotient by the um, integer lattice, then um, any map on the torus, you can linearize by homotopy and express it as a matrix on Zn, a matrix with entries in Z. Um, and then they, they showed that you get basically the same formula. Remember on the circle, we had absolute value 1 minus D, the degree. Um, on the torus, you get absolute value determinant of identity minus A. This is a generalization of the circle formula. They show that it has this many fixed points, and also they all have the same index, either plus 1 or minus 1. And so that means the Lefschetz number equals this number, and the Nielsen number is the absolute value of the determinant of 1 minus A. So on circles, it's easy. On tori, it's also fairly easy. You just find this matrix here, and then that's the formula for the Nielsen number. Um, you can do this also on some other kinds of spaces, nil manifolds, solve manifolds, infra nil manifolds. These are all different generalizations of tori, and the same basic idea works. You express the map on all of these kinds of spaces. You can still express the map as some kind of matrix, and the same, uh, the same formula holds for the Nielsen number on those kinds of spaces. All right. Unfortunately, actually, these are all the kind of easy examples. There aren't many other examples of spaces for which it's easy to compute the Nielsen number. So a lot of examples you see in the Nielsen theory papers are all about tori, because that's a, a uh, especially well-behaved scenario. All right, so there's two parts, the algebraic and the geometric. The geometric part is the index. The algebraic is the lifting classes. Actually, Vecken and Reitermeister realized that you could do these two parts at the same time. This is a little weird, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's a powerful thing. So when, um, when f is a simplicial map, uh, then let's let this be some lift to the universal covering space, just like before. And like I said before, the, they're called the, the lifting classes or the Reitermeister classes. They are the group elements for which this fixed point set is non-empty. And we can consider this set of chains as a pi 1 module. So this is a little strange, but these, these are the, um, the chains uh, when I look at the universal covering space. When, it, when you have the space on the bottom, you can take the chain group of that. When you take the chain group in the universal covering space, every simplex in the covering space is some kind of lifting of some simplex from the bottom space. 
And all of those simplices, you can express them as, um, as fundamental group elements applied to one another. So you can view this as a pi 1x module, which means your map, you can write it as a matrix where the entries are not integers anymore, but entries in this group ring. The, integer, the entries will be uh, integers and also group elements at the same time. And then you can do this, this kind of trace. This is called the Reitemeister trace. It's basically the same as the Lefschetz number, but you are using this weird matrix, which doesn't have just numbers in it, but it's a combination of numbers and group elements. And what you get after you do this whole trace, alternating sum, you get, um, again, a single weird, uh, group element in this group ring, the uh, integers, uh, the group ring, uh, the integer group ring on the fundamental group. Uh, here's an example, like if you're, for some reason, if your fundamental group is generated by A and B, you might compute this, this alternating sum of the traces and get something that looks like this, all right? Uh, and if you do get something that looks like this, what it means is, uh, this first term, this A here, would indicate that there's a fixed point class with index plus one. That's because the, the coefficient here is plus one. And the lifting class, uh, or the Rademeister class, is A. Uh, the next term here, minus AB, means there's another fixed point class with index minus one, and it's lifting... Oh, I have this mixed up, sorry. This should say AB. There's another fixed point class with index minus one and lifting class AB. And then the last term, I, I, I switched those. The last term indicates that there's a fixed point class with index two and lifting class AB, all right? And so the Lefschetz number would be the sum of these indices, which is two. And the Nielsen number would be the number of these things that you see in the sum, which is three, all right? So um, that, that would mean in this example, any map homotopic to F has three fixed points. But the, the point of this, is this Reitemeister trace here, it contains the Lefschetz number and the Nielsen number at the same time. The Lefschetz number is the sum of the coefficients, and the Nielsen number is the, uh, the number of non-zero terms here. Does that mean Lefschetz number is always less than number? Lefschetz number is always less than? Uh, not necessarily, because the, I mean usually, but the coefficients here could, like, there could be a coefficient of like 100 in front of the A. Then the Lefschetz number would be 100, but the Nielsen number is still only three. The Nielsen number is just uh, the number, how many terms you get in the sum, which is three here. Yeah, the left shots could be much bigger or much less. All right. Thank you again for the question. So let's talk about this. The Nielsen number I said before is a lower bound. It's less than or equal to the minimum number of fixed points. Um, what about, uh, when are they equal? The whole purpose of, of inventing the Nielsen number was to compute this minimum number. So it would be nice to say when they're actually equal to each other. Nielsen actually only considered anything. He only was talking about surface homeomorphisms, surface meaning dimension two. And in that case, uh, Nielsen never, um, never demonstrated that they are equal. Uh, although if you read what he said, I mean, Niel uh, Nielsen seems to have believed that they would be equal. That was the whole purpose of making the Nielsen number was that uh, it measures the minimum number of fixed points. Uh, Vecken later on showed that they are actually equal if it's a manifold which is not dimension two. This is a little strange. Nielsen only considered dimension two. Um, it turns out that this is much easier to prove when the dimension is not two. So when the dimension is one, it's easy be just because everything is very uh, easy to handle on the circle. When it's dimension higher than two, um, you can do some kind of uh, transversality geometry arguments. If the dimension is super high, then it's always possible to move the graph of the function off of the, the diagonal uh, without anything strange happening. It's only in dimension two that sometimes it is difficult to, to move the graph around in the way that you need to. Um, anyway, this is called the Vecken theorem, the, the theorem that says the Nielsen number is equal to the minimum number of fixed points in dimension not equal to two. This is the Vecken theorem. Like, uh, this is what I just said. Dimension is one is easy. When it's a high dimension, the, um, it's also easy. The hard case is dimension two. Um, what if, that was all manifolds. What about polyhedra, which are not manifolds? So this was done by Xi in the 60s. He proved that uh, the, the Nielsen number equals the minimum number. For any polyhedron with dimension greater than three and no local separating points, that means there's no, um, no point so a local separating point means if you remove that point from the space, then it disconnects a neighborhood of that point. 
Um, if there's no local separating points and the polyhedron has dimension more than three, then, uh, then Nielsen number equals the minimum number of fixed points. Still, the dimension two case was unsolved for a very long time. Um, Jang in 1979 proved that they are the same for any polyhedron without local separating points, which is not a surface. So still excluding dimension two case. What about surfaces? Which is the original setting that Nielsen was trying to work with? Turned out to be the hardest, the hardest thing of all, which is why I guess he never figured it out. Um, this was also resolved by Jang in the early 1980s, and this was a big uh, breakthrough when Jang figured this out. Um, until then, there was no known example where they are different on a surface, but actually it is possible on the surface for the Nielsen number to be different from the, the minimum number. So Jang made such a map on the pants surface, that is uh, like a disk with two holes removed from it. Um, Jang uh, invented a, an example which has the Nielsen number is zero and the minimum number of fixed points is two. Uh, so they are not equal. So in this example, you have always two fixed points. They will, uh, they're in the same class. They have index plus one and minus one. Um, so the total sum of the indices is zero. So that class is not essential by the definition. Uh, but Jang showed that it's, it's still um, impossible to remove those two fixed points. It's strange. Uh, this paper is called Fixed Points and Braids. He proved this using braid theory, which nobody had tried to use braid theory in fixed point um, in the, this in Nielsen theory before then, as far as I know. Um, it was a good paper, two, two papers. OK, uh, this is, that was my kind of introduction to basic Nielsen theory. I thought I would tell you just briefly about two other kinds of Nielsen theory. Um, in, in you know Nielsen theory, we don't always just focus on fixed points. So one is coincidence theory, which Siraj talked a bit about. And another is periodic points theory. So I thought I'd just give you very briefly uh, a description of those and kind of what, what that's all about. So coincidence theory is when you have two functions, f and g, and you are trying to find points like this, where f of x equal g of x. Um, this is similar to fixed point theory because if the g is the identity, then we're talking about fixed points. But uh, if the g is something else, then we're talking about coincidence. And so a lot of the classical fixed, um, the theorems about fixed points, you can try to copy the proof and make a theorem about coincidences. All you have to do is change all of the identity to g. And then everything uh, works the same way. Although the hard part is sometimes you can't see the identity in the old proof. It's not, not easy to know when you're supposed to change the identity to a G. Anyway, many of these ideas in fixed point theory can be copied in coincidence theory. One of them is the Lefschetz number. So there is such a thing as we call the Lefschetz coincidence number. And in fact, actually, Lefschetz did this originally uh, when he did the Lefschetz fixed point number. He did the Lefschetz coincidence number also. And there is a, a theorem that says if the Lefschetz coincidence number is not zero, then the coincidence set is not empty. Um, one major difference between the fixed point theory and the coincidence theory is that fixed point theory is only about self maps x to x because you have to be able to talk about when f of x equal x. But if you're doing coincidence theory, you don't need to do this. There's no reason to assume that f and g are, fixed, are self maps. So in this setting, we can consider f and g to be maps from one space to a different space. And the Nielsen classes, we can still define the Nielsen classes for coincidences. They're defined like this. So here you have x and y, and they live in a different space from f of x and g of x and f of y and g of y. But um, it is still true that if you have a path from x to y, and these are each coincidences, then x, uh, f of x equals g of x, and f of y equals g of y. And so if you had a path from x to y, and you apply the functions to it, you get another path from f of x to f of y and from g of x to g of y. And if those two paths, uh, if there is such an alpha which makes those two paths over there homotopic, then we say that x and y are in the same Nielsen coincidence class. This was first done by uh, Brooks, who you heard his name before. And there is a coincidence index also, which works. This was also worked out by, uh, by Brooks. There's a coincidence index for maps x to y. Now, the coincidence index requires that these be orientable manifolds of the same dimension. Uh, very recently, there's been some work to try to define it in other contexts, but generally speaking, this is the setting for the coincidence index. They have to be orientable. They have to be orientable because otherwise you can't tell the difference between a plus one and a minus one in the index. 
Um, in the fixed point theory, orientable is not required because of the, the local nature. It's possible to do even without a global orientation, but in the coincidence theory, you need the global orientations. Um, it is possible to define the uh, Nielsen coincidence number, and you can prove this. The Nielsen coincidence number is less than or equal to the minimum number of coincidences. Uh, so the, the Nielsen coincidence theory, in many ways, looks just like the um, Nielsen fixed point theory. And here's a little uh, fact. If you have maps on the torus, you get a nice formula like this, the Nielsen number. Remember, the uh, Nielsen number, uh, the fixed point number on a torus was the determinant of identity minus A. Uh, for the coincidence number, it turns out it's just the determinant of B minus A, where B and A are the, the matrices for F and G. So it works out very nicely. Here's an important subtlety. Actually, this is something that Sirajo mentioned. I hope you don't mind if I repeat uh, a little bit of what he said. We have the minimum number of fixed points, and we also have the minimum number of coincidence points when you change both maps by homotopy. Now, the coincidence set of F and the identity is the same as the fixed point set of F, but this, these are not always equal. The minimum number of coincidence points of F and the identity is not always the same as the minimum number of fixed points, and it's because... It's because of the fact that this minimum coincidence set, uh, the minimum coincidence number, is going to change both maps by a homotopy. So, uh, whereas the minimum number of fixed points can only change the F, the minimum number of coincidence points can change the F and also can change the identity by a homotopy. And it's possible they can get different results. It turns out if X is a one complex that's not the interval of the circle, so like it's a graph, um, then it turns out the minimum coincidence number is zero, uh, but this minimum fixed point number uh, might not be zero. So this number is always zero in such a space. It is always possible to remove the fixed points um, if you change both of the maps by homotopy. But the minimum number of fixed points might still be non-zero. Uh, this is Brooks's theorem from 1972. I actually knew, I, I said a lot about Brooks here. Uh, Brooks was my teacher when I was an undergraduate. This strange coincidence uh, that I, I knew Brooks. Um, Brooks is a very good mathematician. He's not a great teacher. <laughs> but uh, here's uh, Brooks's theorem. Um, it says if x, uh, if y is a manifold, actually it, uh, x can be any, I, I think, any topological space. If y is a manifold, then any coincidence set achieved by changing both maps by homotopy can be achieved by changing only the first map by a homotopy. So that means in particular, in this setting, if y is a manifold, the minimum number of coincidences of f and the identity would actually equal the minimum number of fixed points. But it requires that the y be a manifold. So the example I said before was that if the space is a graph, a one complex, um, that's not a manifold. And it turns out this, this theorem, Brooks's theorem, is not true. So if the codomain is a manifold, we will have this. Um, for a non-manifold, it might not be true. I think this is, this is an interesting subtlety uh, to me. Um, there's still, as uh, Sirajo mentioned, there still is not really any um, coherently defined Nielsen theory for coincidences when you only change one map by a homotopy. The only coincid Nielsen coincidence theory involves changing both of them. And it would be very nice to have a, a Nielsen theory which only changes one, but it's, it's hard. Okay, the other thing I want to tell you about uh, just briefly is periodic points. There's also a Nielsen theory for periodic points. These are just two different ways you can generalize fixed points. You know, fixed points are when f of x equals x. Periodic points are like this, f to the n of x. That's the iterate of f. You do f of f of f of f of x, like that. These are called periodic points, um, for, and n is called the period of the periodic points. And again, uh, you can consider fixed point theory is simply the case of periodic points when n equals 1. So you can try to take a fixed point theorem and try to prove it instead for periodic points by change all the ones to an n. It's not so easy. But uh, the set of periodic points is another way of seeing it. this. The, um, the set of periodic points of period n is also a fixed point set. It's the fixed points of the uh, nth iterate of f. Again, there are subtleties. You know, uh, a Nielsen theory for this setting would be to try to figure out what's the minimum number of periodic points, all right, when we change the map by a homotopy. Here's a subtlety. If you look at this, the minimum number of fixed points of f to the n, that is not the minimum number of periodic points. This is uh, a little strange. That's because this means you start with f to the n and you change f to the n by a homotopy. 
That's different from starting with f and changing f by a homotopy and then doing the iterations of that. Uh, I'm going to show you an example. We want to consider maps like this. g is homotopic to f, and then we look at g to the n, the iterative g. This doesn't fit neatly into Nielsen's original theory. Here's a weird example just to sh demonstrate why there's a special theory for this. Um, it's not, the, the function is very simple. Um, f of z equals z bar, so I'm thinking of this as the, the unit circle in the complex plane. This complex conjugation, so we're just like doing a reflection, vertical flipping of the circle, right? This is the degree minus one circle map, so because we know the Nielsen theory of the circle, um, the Nielsen number of that would be two, so every map homotopic to f has two fixed points. It's obvious that map itself has two fixed points, but you cannot make any less than that by changing biohomotopy. So, um, this complex conjugate map has two fixed points. That means automatically every uh, map homotopic to F also has two periodic points of any period. Because you have two fixed points, then you automatically have two periodic points of the higher periods. All right. But we're talking about the complex conjugation. So the second iteration is the identity, right? Because when you do the conjugate of the conjugate, you get the identity. And the, the identity, you can make uh, fixed point free by uh, just the circle. Well, I'm talking about the circle. The identity on the circle can be rotated by a small amount to make no fixed points, all right? So the, the, uh, this iteration, f squared, can be made uh, to have no fixed points at all. Uh, this, is, this is strange, though, if you remember what we just said before. Um, so this means the minimum number of f squared is 0, even though I already said f must have period, periodic points in period 2 because it has fixed points, it has two fixed points. Even if you change f by homotopy, it must have two periodic points of period two, even though it is possible to remove all the fixed points of the second iteration. This is, uh, this is strange. Uh, what I've just been saying disregards whether this is the least period. Usually when people talk about periodic points, they talk about the least period as opposed to the, the, any other periods. Um, anyway, there, are, there is a Nielsen theory for periodic points, and there are two different Nielsen numbers. Uh, they are called different things, but like NPN, this measures the periodic points with least period N, and NFN, this is another Nielsen number, measures the periodic points of any period uh, N, not necessarily the least period. It's uh, always surprising to me that NPN turns out to be easier to compute the points with the least period. The NF is harder, uh, but there are two different Nielsen theories for, for this. Uh, on, uh, like you might expect, on circles and tori, there are nice formulas for these numbers, but otherwise it's, it's quite difficult and not, not much is known about computing them. All right, that's all I got for today. Next time, uh, um, if you are willing to hear from me again, I'm going to talk uh, about fixed points in digital topology tomorrow. It's easier, in my opinion. <laughs> all right, thanks. <laughs>